For all those waiting on the sides, there are a few more seats in the central banks here. So one of the objectives I was determined that we would meet today was to run to time. <laughs> Ambitious, perhaps. Okay. I can't personally intervene on that one, but... Uh... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd now like to welcome David Herman, who's going to chair our first session. David, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. That's very kind of you. Uh, our session is going to be on collecting Holocaust testimonies in cultural context, early testimonies. I'm sorry about the echo. I hope that is not disturbing you too much, and I hope it can be sorted out. We have got three 20-minute presentations. Those of you who are particularly hypernumerate might be wondering why we've got four people. Uh, especially when there are five in the program. Uh, we've got four people because two are doing a joint presentation, and uh, unfortunately, Daniel Schuch from Jena University could not join us today. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, let me introduce Sarah Jones, Professor of Modern Languages at the University of Birmingham, who will analyze different ways in which Holocaust testimony is circulated through our culture. And because in this particular session we're going to run a very tight ship and we're not going to overrun, so each person will be allowed to speak for 20 minutes and not a second longer. Sarah. Right, noted. <laughs> um, is this working? Yeah, great, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, thank you very much um, for the invitation to speak. Um, I am, uh, as David said, going to speak more about the cultural context than necessarily about early testimonies. Um, and specifically, I'm going to talk about a couple of projects that I've been working on over the last, I guess, five, no, seven years. Um, and, and one of the major outputs um, that uh, should be appearing in, uh, well, an Amazon near you uh, in, in about uh, two months. Okay, um, so from 2016 to 2019, I was a principal investigator for an international, interdisciplinary, and cross sector network with the title Culture and its Uses as Testimony. Uh, and the network aimed to explore the many different ways in which testimony, including especially Holocaust testimony, is produced, transformed, and circulated in and through cultural practices, such as film, literature, education, social media, autobiography, mu museums, and so on. Um, and one of our key concerns was the implications of producing testimony through culture for education and memorialization and in the context of the loss of the survivor generation. So one major outcome of the project is the Palgrave Handbook of Testimony and Culture, um, which is due out probably in June. Um, the handbook contains 25 chapters, many of which are co-authored by academics working across disciplines and in many cases with experts from outside the academy, including those working in Holocaust education. I made this for fun. <laughs> um, so researchers contributing for, to the handbook are based in a wide range of academic disciplines. Uh, practitioners include novelists, a community theatre director, museum and memorial researchers, exhibition designers, community pro education program developers, and film producers. Um, and this is a word cloud from uh, the table of contents, uh, just to give you an idea of the different things that are, are covered. Memories of the Holocaust are the focus of many of the chapters in the handbook, and I'm going to focus on those today, although I will touch on other cultural contexts. Um, and the volume also includes a number of chapters that incorporate the perspective of actors in, in, in these different contexts. <laughs> um, in, including uh, consideration of how they challenge the paradigms created by the long-standing practice of Holocaust testimony. Um, so contributions to the handbook examining testimony presented by survivors and perpetrators of trauma, writers, playwrights, filmmakers, asylum seekers, political and cultural activists leading community initiatives, museums, commemoration foundations, educational bodies, war crime tribunals, truth and reconciliation commissions, the press, new social media, and virtual reality projects. <laughs> 
So what I want to do today is give a flavor of the key findings of the handbook and what we can learn about testimony, especially Holocaust testimony, from this focus on culture. Um, and much of what I will say today draws on the introduction to the volume that I co-authored with Professor Roger Woods of the University of Nottingham, who was co-investigator of the network and co-editor of the handbook. Um, so first, a quick note on, on how we're defining testimony, uh, so what it is and equally what it is not. Um, so in the handbook, we quite deliberately worked with a very broad definition that incorporates the multiple ways in which narratives about the self are produced, mediated, and remediated. So we understand testimony to be an account given by an individual about something they have experienced, received by someone who has not had that experience and who makes a judgment about it. And we include here the activity of individuals who mediate and remediate the first person accounts of others, including consideration of concepts such as secondary and even tertiary witnessing. And we argue what marks testimony off from other forms of communication is that it stands as evidence in a contested field and as a particular public purpose. In the context of the Holocaust, this contested field is that of Holocaust denial and secondary anti-Semitism. Central to, dis to discussions of testimony are questions of epistemology, that is, if and how testimony can be considered a source of knowledge, and I think there'll be more on that um, in the session on oral history uh, next. Um, we are reliant on the accounts of others, Knowledge based purely on what we can see, hear, smell, and so on is extremely limited. However, we face the problem that testimonial knowledge is knowing at second hand, as it's been described. If we accept testimony as knowledge, it is because we trust the speaker and grant them the authority to speak. On the other hand, the value of testimony to trauma, especially perhaps Holocaust testimony, is centered on what Krima and Weigler term existential or embodied truth. Here, the truth of the survivor testimony is inseparable from the speaker of that testimony. The credibility of the witness relates to their having been there. Nonetheless, it is still the audience who invests them with this trustworthiness. Testimony must not only be believable, but also worthy of being believed. And this is where German comes in, in, in handy, um, because they have two terms, glaubhaft uh, and glaubwürdig, um, so believable and worthy of being believed. But what is it about first-person accounts that makes it worthy of being believed? We've perhaps, I would hope, reached a point where survivors of the Holocaust are normally and normatively believed when they recount their experiences, although this has not always been the case, and it's still not always the case. In other contexts, survivors of traumatic events, especially gender-based violence, are in contrast often seen as unreliable or tainted witnesses. In the handbook, handbook chapter on the UK asylum system, Harry Reid and Rebecca Hayes Lawton demonstrate the suspicion that assessors of asylum claims often bring to encounters with the testimony of refugees. The testifier here is forced to prove their credibility and status as witness. This often means following anticipated, sometimes gendered scripts and pre-formulated narratives that conform to what those assessing the claim expect to hear about the witness's country of origin or the type of experience they are recounting. These witnesses are not automatically granted that status by virtue of having been present at and the victim of an act of violence. Alongside other contributors, Reed and Hayes Lawton reflect on the potential of art and the intervention of filmmakers, theatre producers and NGOs to create a space in which these marginalised voices can find what Gilmore terms an adequate witness to hear their stories. Their focus is on theatre performances written and staged by refugees with the support of the organisation Women for Refugee Women. This highlights the role that those who are not first-hand witnesses play in the production and circulation of testimony. Filmmakers, theatre producers, editors and NGOs collect, reformulate and remediate witnessing accounts in ways that allow them to have a greater impact on the given social, cultural and political context. We see this also, or especially, in the circulation of Holocaust testimonies, which are recorded on video, stored and remixed in and by archives, produced through digital technologies, inserted into museum and memorial exhibitions, and rewritten as fiction or as autobiography. In short, testimony is mediated in a variety of ways. It is created, presented, received, reworked, interpreted, appropriated, and circulated across different media. 
Mediation may be performed knowingly and with a particular purpose. This is generally the case for testimony use in Holocaust education, where the purpose is to inform and even to change behavior. The stated aim of Holocaust education often goes beyond the transmission of historical facts and includes the wish to reduce prejudice and intergroup conflict. Claudia Rees and Louise Stafford of the National Holocaust Center and Museum note in their contribution to the handbook that survivors who regularly participate in educational events practice and hone their accounts for particular audiences. Witnesses know what audiences expect, and that shapes their accounts. Katie Stone and Roger Woods examine in the volume how dominant narratives of Holocaust rep representation similarly place demands on survivors and their testimony. Studying the mediation of testimony also means studying the media through which it is presented. We, I talk about cultural studies scholars, may be used to examining and critiquing the mediations of testimony in video, archives, and films. But what new challenges and opportunities present themselves as the virtual turn in testimony establishes itself in the post-witness era? One example of digital Holocaust testimony is the Dimensions in Testimony project, a collaboration between the Institute for Creative Te Technologies of the University of Southern California and the Shoah Foundation. Whereas the well-known Fortune of Video Testimony Project was concerned with recording and preserving Holocaust survivors' accounts, Dimensions in Testimony makes them into an interactive experience for current and future generations of learners by selecting from a database of survivors pre-recorded answers to the most frequently asked questions and simulating a live conversation between survivors and audiences. This new development in mediation raises numerous ethical and pedagogical questions and has divided opinion among researchers and practitioners alike. Amit Pinkevsky points out that this interaction is not based on the, and I quote, the witness's actual articulations and misarticulations caught on tape that constitute the entire scope of the testimony and its interpretative potential. He argues that it strips out of the learner's experience the pain of witnessing and the difficulty of relating past experience. The trauma is removed from testimony. Against these concerns, one must recognize the danger that archived video testimony, such as that in the Fortune of Project, may remain just that and fade from public view in decades to come. Contributors to the handbook are similarly preoccupied with the digital turn. Eva Kovacs asks whether digital testimony presents opportunities for decontextualization, fragmentation, and misinterpretation of sources. Kovacs quotes Wolf Kansteiner's proposed mediation for teachers and heritage professionals in response to digital culture. She says, it is our task to frame the digital experiences and embed them in collective learning processes that allow digital natives and digital immigrants to join forces in de-radicalization and violence prevention learning environments. In the handbook, Christina Bruning, Verena Nigel, and Sana Stegmaier examine what such framing in educational settings looks like in practice in Germany through the case study of the various digital mediations of the testimony of Anita lasker Walfisch. And I've seen we've just another one to add to that. Um, they show that if students are to derive benefit from using interactive digital testimony, testimony needs to be contextualized, and sessions need to be monitored by educators to prevent inappropriate questions and behavior. Alongside these pedagogical considerations, the discussion of mediation, including of digital testimony, is frequently a discussion based on ethics. Across the handbook, contributors address the question of what testimony is, but also what it can do. Testimony is often used by practitioners because of its presumed qualities, its privileging of individual experience, its ability to generate effective and emotional responses, its complexity and richness and its potential to act as a form of symbolic justice. It's here that we sometimes see a tension between theory and practice. On the one side, purist theoretical frameworks that unpick the nature of concepts such as mediation, authenticity, empathy, and the transformative potential of testimony. And on the other, the hands-on experience of working with survivors in contexts that are restricted politically, socially, and practically. And I experienced this potential for conflict firsthand in the network's follow-on project, which included the co-production 
of the innovative theatre performance A Land Full of Heroes, based on the life and literature of the author Carmen Francesca Bontu, who had been a dissident in communist Romania. Throughout that project, there was a negotiation between the struggles of the witness to tell her story on stage, the artistic vision of the theatre company, La Conquesta del Pol Sud, and my aim to explore and practice what the outcome of bringing together multiple mediations of testimony would be. Indeed, models for best practice in mediating testimony can set the bar very high. Yet this ambitious goal must be reconciled with the time and space constraints within which practitioners work. This is especially true in the context of Holocaust education. Testimony has been a long-standing staple of Holocaust education, both in and outside the classroom. Live testimony has often been viewed as the gold standard in this context. The experience of hearing a survivor speak in person is perceived as irreplaceable, and I would agree that it is. Yet as we move towards the post-witness era, Holocaust educators are looking for ways to sustain the presence of survivor testimony in their institutions in the absence of the survivors themselves. As discussed by Rees and Stafford in the handbook, the Forever Project and the Journey Exhibition at the National Holocaust Center and Museum are examples of these efforts in quite different formats, which recreate different qualities of first-person testimony. Forever uses digital technology that allows the visitors and students to ask questions of the recorded testimony and have these questions answered by the survivors themselves, albeit in pre-recorded form. It thereby seeks um, to recreate the authenticating sense of presence and the impression of dialogue. The Journey exhibition combines survivor accounts to create a new witnessing text, which is designed with a specific aim of being accessible to a particular young audience and creating understanding and empathy among that group. Blurring the distinction between the physical and the digital, the journey is now also available as an innovative app. The contribution by Rees and Stafford, and that by Rachel Century, Isabel Wollaston, and Alex Blake, the latter focused on the work of the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, demonstrates that the deployment of survivor testimony in a variety of formats is not new in Holocaust education. The Trust makes significant use of first-person accounts of survivors in short films, audio recordings, and written texts, as well where possible in live encounters with witnesses. Teachers educating students about the Holocaust across the curriculum have long made use of texts and materials that might be understood as testimony in our broad definition of the term, including literary and filmic representations that are or incorporate testimony, uh, for example, the Diary of Anne Frank. In the handbook, uh, Francisco Luigi, Caroline Sharples, uh, and Charlotte Chalet, and Andrea Webb dry, describe new, project, new approaches to the use of survivor testimony in Holocaust education that make use of the potential for a multiplicity of voices, active engagement, and dialogue <clears throat> afforded by artistic representation. In this case, interactive theater and graphic novels. Um, this, uh, for example, this one, But I Live. These authors located in the practice of Holocaust education argue for the benefits of an approach that uses testimony, the individualization of history, potential for identification with a survivor group, and the construction of empathy. However, they also point towards the risks and ethical considerations entailed in the use of survivor testimony in this context. Century, Wollaston, and Blake indicate how HMDT adapts first-person accounts and life narratives to fit particular educational purposes and to make them short and accessible, making sense on their own terms, as they say. This intervention into the survivor accounts is necessary to make the materials usable by the target audiences. But as the authors note, the complexity, ambiguities, and the internal rhythms are inevitably simplified and sometimes even lost. Century, Williston, and Blake consider the concerns raised by several commentators that Holocaust education and commemoration focus on lessons learned from rather than about the Holocaust. This can result in decontextualization, a flattening of the complexity of the history of the Holocaust, and comfortable narratives of survival and heroism in humanity's darkest hour. The Holocaust Memorial Day Trust is aware of and works to mitigate against these risks in its use of survivor testimony. Nonetheless, a recurring concern in the contributions to the handbook uh, handbook is that survivor testimony might be appropriated in a process that denies witnesses agency over their own accounts. 
the ethical imperative to allow survivors to speak on their own terms and to prompt audiences to take action has inspired and shaped many mediations of testimony through culture. Complexity, ambiguity, empathy, and the potential for multiple interpretations are also central to artistic uses of testimony described in the handbook. Producing testimony in dialogue with survivors, a particularly active form of co-authorship, can also be a process of restoring agency. This is seen, for example, in the collaboration between survivors and artists in the narrative art and visual storytelling in Holocaust and Human Rights Education Project, which produced the But I Live volume of, of graphic novels, um, which I just mentioned. Uh, Reed and Hayes Lawton described the work of Women for Refugee Women to co-create with refugees works that allow testimony to be produced and performed beyond the constraints of the asylum system. Their creative works combine first-person accounts with poetry, metaphor, and imaginative elements that challenge the idea of a singular truth and liberal notions of individual personhood and subjectivity that underpin the official asylum process. So to come to a conclusion. Around Holocaust Memorial Day 2023, the University of Birmingham's Jewish Society invited Holocaust survivor Mindu Hornick to speak about her life. The enormous lecture theatre in our teaching and learning building was packed out, with students and colleagues sitting on steps and floor. Mindu held their rapt attention as she spoke of persecution, the murder of family members, internment in Auschwitz, and establishing a new life in the UK after the war. In the question and answer part of the evening, audience members drew connections between what they had heard and contemporary politics, suggesting that they too wanted to learn lessons from Mindu's story. Mindu and many other survivors have devoted years of their life to sharing their stories in the belief that this would help prevent future violence. The giving of live, in-person testimony is a unique experience which I feel privileged to have experienced. I don't believe that experience can be replicated and it's clear that in the future we will be reliant on Holocaust testimony mediated through culture. This is nothing new. In order to travel across space and time and reach multiple audiences, testimony has always been recorded in different media, from the scrolls buried in the ground at Auschwitz to collaborative theatre performances such as Sea Lavender or the Euphoria of Being, discussed in the handbook by Eva Kovacs, and you can see an image here. We are, however, at a threshold when there is a significant need to discuss what we will do with testimony and culture, how and why it will be used in education about and memorialise of the genocide of the European Jews, well, there is still time to take advice from those giving testimony. And the handbook seeks to make one contribution to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Jones. And now there's a joint presentation by Barbara Warnock, Senior Curator and Head of Education at the Wiener Holocaust Library, and Christine Schmidt, Deputy Director and Head of Research at the Wiener Holocaust Library on the early Holocaust survivor eyewitness accounts gathered by Dr. Eva Reichmann for the Wiener Library in London in the 1950s. Thanks, David, and thanks, everybody. And of course, thanks to the AGR for inviting us. Um, we're taking, again, a slightly different, taking a step back in time to talk about um, the early eyewitness accounts uh, or testimonies gathered by the Wiener Library in the 1950s. Uh, when the project recorded some 1,300 accounts over five years in the UK, uh, Europe, and beyond. Um, as we've heard uh, from the opening remarks by Lord Pickles and Bea, uh, the library's first director of research, Eva Reichmann, uh, who was a German Jewish refugee scholar, was in charge of this project. And of course, for those of you who don't know, I think we've, the library has been mentioned uh, a few times, but um, the library is one of the oldest institutions collecting on the Holocaust. Um, we began our work in the 1930s with the work of our founder, Alfred Wiener, who was a German Jewish intellectual uh, and activist who collected and disseminated information about the rise of the Nazis as the events were unfolding. And the um, efforts of, of Wiener and his colleagues moved first to Amsterdam and then to London, where we're, of course, still based today. Um, we're located over at Russell Square, and in addition to the largest collection of Holocaust-related uh, material in the UK, including access to many of the testimony collections you'll hear about at this conference, we have a vibrant events and exhibitions program. So everyone is, of course, welcome to come over and, and visit us anytime. 
So to begin, um, everything has a history, and this includes really how documents and other materials come to be collected and preserved, like the library's eyewitness accounts collection. And so first I want to situate this um, effort to um, collect within the history of early collecting during and after the Holocaust more generally. And there has been a lot of scholarship, as, as Bea mentioned this morning, done on early documentation and research efforts, um, particularly since the groundbreaking work of Laura Jokush, whose uh, work you see here, Collect and Record. She analyzed early Holocaust commissions, or early, early historical commissions that began research on the Holocaust just after the war in France, Poland, Germany, and elsewhere. And she shows that those who collected documentation began to do so even while the Holocaust unfolded, including within the camps and ghettos and at great risk to themselves. And some of these same individuals, like Alfred Wiener, went on to form these historical commissions after the war. They aimed to document who was murdered and to collect evidence for war crimes investigation and prosecution, as well as for memorialization purposes. This all derived from the tradition of Herbenforschung, which I've um, included here in case you haven't heard this term before, um, roughly translates as destruction research, which was developed by Eastern European Jews long before World War II. And I've included just a few examples of the recent work um, and conferences that have focused specifically on the role of victims and survivors documenting their own destruction here. Of course, there's many more I could cite. And although it hasn't been treated extensively in this literature, the Wiener Library's work before, during, and after the war can be um, situated very well into this frame of early Holocaust collecting. Now, more about the library's project. Um, Eva Reichman, who was here writing in the Journal of the Association of Jewish Refugees in 1954, launched the first major public call for the project. She wrote, we all bear witness. We all have a duty to fulfill towards our past political developments on a global as well as on the Jewish level are not too auspicious for keeping alive the memory of German Jewry, end quote. And incidentally, the title of Barbara in my uh, talk comes from a draft uh, that she wrote for this article, which she had titled, We Are All Witnesses, which is slightly different from the final version. The call Reichman published in AJR Information indicates the context for understanding the creation and scope of the library's project because it situates the project to collect and, uh, and the library's work more generally within the social and cultural framework of the survivor and refugee community in Britain and beyond. Supported by the Claims Conference, the project was carried out over about five years and eventually amassed some 1,300 accounts. It was done in cooperation with Yad Vashem in Israel, which administered the grant. And the interviewers included many women, and many were Holocaust survivors and refugees themselves. The library had a rich archival collection of correspondence that provides further information about the creation of the accounts, the administration of the claims grant, and correspondence between Reichman and those who conducted and gave these interviews. So a bit more about uh, Ava Reichman, who we, whom we've heard about already today. Like many of those who participated in the project, either as interviewers or interviewees, she was a German Jewish refugee who came to Britain before the Second World War. She became director of research at the library in 1945. And like Wiener, she had worked for the Zentralverein, or the Central Association of German Citizens of Jewish Faith, before she and her husband, the jurist Hans Reichmann, left Germany for London after he had been rounded up during Kristallnacht and released from Sachsenhausen with her help. And like Wiener, she too lost family during the Holocaust. Her mother, Agnes Jungmann, was deported to Theresienstadt in September 1942 and did not survive. She was a prolific writer and thinker on anti-Semitism and antecedents to the Holocaust, and she published Hostages of Civilization in 1950, which analyzed the debate on the alleged failure of Jewish emancipation and its relationship to the Holocaust. She became extensively involved in the German-speaking Jewish refugee community in England. And for Reichmann, the imperative to collect grew out of her scholarship and critical work in the area of communal defense. And we can see from her writing on the project that the aim was to memorialize a culture and society that she saw as have, having been effectively destroyed, a kind of preservation of a, quote, lost past or heritage, in the words of another historian, Zoe Waxman. But she also wanted to promote future research into the origins of that destruction. Reichmann saw gathering eyewitness accounts as a means of filling gaps in the evidence that she saw being left by the purposeful destruction of documents or their potential unreliability due to censorship during the Nazi period. 
In short, she, along with others, was shaping early research on the Holocaust period not long after the events had ended. So just a few words about the methodology of this project, and maybe picking up on some of what Sarah said about mediation. Reichman directed a small group of paid staff members and relied on additional volunteers to conduct interviews and to collect the reports. Interviewers throughout Europe traced, contacted, and persuaded potential interviewees to participate, usually by word of mouth or advertisements in newspapers, like the one um, I showed a few minutes ago. And they began very close to London and then eventually became more systematic and spread out. The reports were only occasionally written by the authors themselves, and essentially these were heavily mediated co-creations drawn up by both the interviewer and interviewee together. And after one or more interviews, interviews this, this kind of a report was drawn up, and it was then reviewed by Reichman and her staff, quote, to ensure that it contained no mistake or misunderstanding, end quote, and checked with the interviewee and often signed off. And it was then incorporated into the archive, cross-indexed and cataloged by a team of mainly women staff. Here you can see some of the handwritten evidence of Reichman's mediation. She was making kind of corrections to the report, the spellings, the dates, um, and grammar, and her notes are left in the final account in the collection. So why is this important? It all sounds a bit kind of like boring details, maybe. But it's evidence of the ways in which Reichman inter intervened to help create what she and others came to see as, a, as an accurate account. And nowadays, we often consider survivor testimonies, perhaps especially audiovisual testimonies, as sacrosanct in a way, that every word that is recorded is meant to be preserved and perhaps even unquestioned. And here we see Reichman making decisions based on different assumptions at the time about what made a correct version of a survivor's story. She was also working to ensure that the witnesses had credibility, and particularly with regard to dates and other verifiable facts. Now, before I hand over to Barbara, who's going to talk a little bit more about some specific examples, I just want to show two more slides that give more information about the methodology and some of the unseen labor of librarians, catalogers, and interviewers. I have to do this because I come from an institution where they're very important to us, um, that went into creating early collections of Holocaust testimonies. And here you get a sense of the kinds of categories of information that interested the team as they developed this collection. And as you can see, the main priority in terms of the coverage was to encourage interviewers to examine the period 1933 to 1945, although we have some examples where the um, information stretches beyond this uh, period. And while we don't have the questions that each interviewer asked, it seems that very few people were asked to reflect on their lives after 1945 or to think about the meaning of their experience, although this did happen occasionally. And there was also no push to include a kind of didactic message about lessons at the end, as in some later audiovisual accounts. And as I mentioned, the project did not have this kind of set number of questions, but each interviewer often shaped the nature of the interview and questions asked. Here, for example, is Nelly Wolfheim, who was a feminist specialist in Freudian-based psychoanalytic pedagogy for young children. She was banned from her work in Nazi Germany before fleeing to Britain at the age of 60. And she was interviewed for the project and then conducted a number of fascinating interviews with older refugees in the Otto Schiff home. Her accounts focused in the main on gender, women's financial independence, as well as predictably psychological health and related issues. And so each kind of set of interviews that conducted by a single interviewer can be read as a kind of separate sub-collection. So now I'm going to hand over to Barbara, who's going to talk about some of the uh, collection of non-German language materials that we have in, this, in these testimonies. Thanks very much, Christine, and, and uh, thanks also to the um, organisers and the AJR and everyone involved. Um, so I'm going to talk to you um, about a very specific subsection of the collection, just in order to kind of give you a sense of the, the types of material that is sometimes available in this collection. So a sub a subset of the um, overall collection is um, on resistance and I've got on the screen there one document that comes from this collection. Um, it's a collection of um, 49 different documents about resistance, about anti-Nazi resistance and this particular inst instance here 
is related to a group called the Baum Group, who were a Jewish communist group in Berlin who did various things, including launching um, a sabotage arson attack on a Nazi anti-Soviet exhibition, for example. Most of the group ultimately ended up being executed, but there were some survivors, and they later gave an account to the Wiener Library. Um, the leader of the group is, is pictured there on, on, on the left, but he was executed. So as I say, this is just a small sub-collection of the overall collection, and then I'm going to kind of go into in a sub-sub-collection of it as well. So um, this particular collection, it, it, it looks at anti-Nazi resistance, particularly in the German Reich, in Poland, in Holland, in France and Czechoslovakia. But I'm going to focus on a group of documents that come actually from Belgium, and the Belgium resistant documents are very interesting and they are also, as a group, there is quite a few of them given, given the small size of this collection. So it's 14 reports by 13 people. It's therefore about 30% of the overall collection on resistance. These are documents in French and they are documents that include accounts from some of the key figures in um, Jewish resistance in Belgium. So for example, Roger Vram Prague, and I apologize for my pronunciation of everything, um, Harva Groschman, also known as Yvonne Jospa, and her husband Geert, and these were the, the founders of um, the Comité de Défense des Juifs, uh, CDJ, and I'll talk more about that organization later. Others um, gave accounts who were involved in the Belgian Partisan Army, the Jewish company of that army, and also there is an account from the head of the Bund in Belgium as well. So it's quite a fascinating collection. We can see from our own internal archives um, that the collection of these documents seems to have been um, quite important to both Alfred Wiener, pitched on the left there, and Ava Reichmann, who I'm sure by now you're recognizing. Um, they um, corresponded with the person in charge of this project in Belgium uh, quite extensively. So he was Kurt Zeilinger. They also met him on a number of occasions. And he was deputy director of a Jewish welfare organization in Belgium. And the, the resistance reports that he organized and, and gathered from Belgium are part of a wider group that, that he collected, a wide, wider group of testimonies um, from Belgium that cover all sorts of different um, topics. And um, Eva Reichmann said in a letter that we have in our collection to Zeilinger um, that the reports from Belgium are particularly important um, to us. So I'm just going to talk to you about, the, just make a few points about the different um, things that the, the documents can tell us and the different themes that they show. Um, so one thing that they point to is, is the range and variety of, of Jewish resistance in um, Belgium. So this sort of somewhat anonymized account by um, Monsieur C, um, he was in the Jewish company of the Partisan Army, and in his account he talks of all, all sorts of act actions. So um, this includes um, bomb attacks, attempts to attack uh, Wehrmacht soldiers, it includes sabotage mis missions, and also his extensive work in weapons manufacturing, in covert weapons manufacturing for the resistance. So it's a very interesting attack. And one thing that struck me in looking at this document is that uh, slightly unusually for the Wiener Library's eyewitness accounts, he does actually report his kind of feelings and emotional reactions to something. So in this particular extract, he reports after a bomb attack that he felt overwhelmed by a thrilling, unadulterated joy which kept me awake the entire night. And that kind of emotional response is slightly unusual in our, um, in our eyewitness accounts. Um, so other documents talk about um, the systematic efforts to provide Jews with false papers, um, efforts at counter-propaganda, and the extensive child rescue networks, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment, that there were in um, Belgium. Another thing that I found interesting in looking at these reports um, was that they give us quite a lot of information about the um, background of the Jewish resistors. 
um, in terms of where they came from, but also in terms of their prior political commitments. So 94% of Belgium's Jewish population at this point were born um, outside of, of the country. Um, and in the Wiener Library's documents and, and the, those who gave testimonies, that there's, a, there's a correlation between them being involved in Jewish resistance and previous experiences of anti-Semitic persecution and even pogroms. So, for example, a number of of the people um, interviewed for the project actually originally came from Kishinev and they, there are actually some um, accounts of, for example, the, the 1905 um, pogroms there. Um, so so this, is, this is a feature of the, of the background of, of quite a number of the, the resistors. Um, and um, Dan Michman has, has argued that, that sometimes those who, who came um, from um, without a country, came from abroad, were, were sometimes more prepared and ready um, psychologically and in other ways to resist. Um, and this is perhaps borne out in the um, Wiener Library's accounts here. Um, other accounts point to um, a number of the, the resistors having a prior commitment to various aspects of left-wing politics, whether that was through the Bund or involvement in um, efforts to um, support the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War, various different activities. So the reports also um, give us a useful insight into the role of um, the role of women in um, the resistance movements in Belgium. Um, so half the accounts are by women. Um, and this, this is sort of a, a larger proportion than in other accounts of resistance in the Wiener Library's collection. And the role of women as resistors has sometimes been understated in the historiography. And these are two, two accounts from two different um, resistors there. Um, and Harper Fry, who is um, quoted there, she, she talked about how when she became pregnant, her activities distributing leaflets and trying to gain intelligence from essentially chatting up German soldiers in cafes actually became easier because, as she said, for who would suspect a woman in my position? So it just sort of points to a, a gendered aspect to this resistance. And then um, I could talk about all sorts of things, but um, finally, just to talk about the operation of these very extensive um, of child um, rescue networks. Um, so the Wiener Library's documents um, are, um, have got a huge amount of information about the, these networks, about their efforts to connect with all sorts of different forms of resistance in Belgium, the huge operations to produce for the children ID cards, um, baptismal records, other forms of false papers, um, and also it, the, the dominant role of women um, in these um, efforts. Um, we've even got accounts which show that the resistors sometimes even managed to get the Nazis unwittingly to support the children. And so Yvonne Josper here talks about how um, on one occasion the uh, Nazi winter, uh, winter rescue organization actually um, took um, a group of um, Jewish children off on a, on a, on a holiday um, unwittingly. So ultimately 2,400 Jewish children um, were saved in Belgium through these very extensive networks. Only one group of any significant size was uncovered by the Nazis. Um, and our documents... Our documents reveal ha um, also a huge amount of information about the, the kind of not just the networks, but the kind of fundraising efforts that were very important in supporting um, this child rescue mission. And there's an, a, a very extensive account by Roger van Prague about all the efforts that he went to in order to gather money. So as Edith Sterno, a woman involved in all of this, um, mentions here, um, there were great efforts to raise money. You know, it was very sort of exp expensive. Um, so, I'm just about um, out of time, but it just gives you something to give you some insight into... Um, I don't really have time for that, so I'll just move on. Um, some insight into the um, Wiener Library's collections on this subject. So, um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you both so much. Uh, our final speaker is Professor Joanna Mischlisch, uh, a visiting full professor at Lund University at, and at, the UC, at UCL, and founder and first director of a project on families, children, and Holocaust at Brandeis. Oh,
and uh, in addition to passing on the various notes to other speakers. So thank you so much. Thank you, David, for this kind introduction. Thank you to the organizers, to Bea and the leadership of HRR. I'm a social historian, and I have worked with Holocaust, child Holocaust testimonies in different collections in Poland, Israel, United States, Canada, and Great Britain, and most recently in Sweden. And I have published a lot, uh, but today on the subject, but today I will be giving you only a few insights given the time constraints. Child Holocaust survivors born in the 1920s are today the last living witnesses to the Holocaust. Child survivors have for a long time been producing a tremendous amount of personal accounts in various forms, written and oral, straightforward, non-literary testimonies. Some child survivors are also authors of a substantial body of imaginative literature about the Holocaust, expressing po poetry and prose. Few child survivors wrote a contemporary Holocaust account, such as diaries, from within the event in hiding when they were still fugitives. But the first large salient production of child survivors' testimonies emerged during the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust, 1945-1949, in the forms of interviews, oral, written, and pictorial testimonies, as well as memoirs and letters. I'll be focusing on this early possible body of testimonies in my talk, but just to remind us, the second wave or waves of child survivors' testimonies occurred in the 1960s and the 1970s, but did not generate an interest among historians neither. Of course, the first uh, body of testimonies from the early post-war period by historians have been discovered only in the early 2000s. However, at that time, literary scholars, psychologists, and psychotherapists Many of them, members of the second generation in making, children of Jewish survivors were the first to discover and utilize the voices of their parents' survivors in their studies, often anonymously. In the studies, we find some topics identified as secret memories, such as sexual abuse of Jewish children during the Holocaust, topic that only very recently have been discussed publicly, acknowledged, become public knowledge, and analyzed by scholars. The 1980s and the 1990s saw an emergence of a final major wave or tsunami of the late post-war child survivors' testimonies, taking a variety of forms, new forms based on the latest technologies, videotape testimonies, as well as older forms. Child survivors' voices constitute a large collections of the 34,000 testimonies at the Fortune of Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies at Yale University, co-founded by survivor and psychoanalyst Dori Laub, and informed by therapeutic ideas. Child survivors' voices constitute also large sections of Steven Spielberg's show Visual History Foundation that collected 52,000 testimonies between 1994 and 2002. And of course, we have the Yad Vashem archives and many national, local, and regional archives and museums that contain child Holocaust testimonies. But I also wanted to point out that there are also some child survivors who have not given their testimonies yet because for a variety of reasons. By the early 2000s, thanks to the development of oral history discipline and childhood studies and major shifts in the Holocaust historiography, the post-war testimonies of child survivors have been gradually accepted as an important mainstream documentation in the historical reconstructions of the Holocaust and memories of the past. And here I give you only a few selections of the works that were published utilizing child Holocaust testimonies. 
And yet, as I argue, the children's turn in Holocaust studies remains marginal today. In my own work, I show the importance of Jewish children's ego documents for the study of the neglected aspects of the social history of the Holocaust and post-1945 intimate history of Jewish family and childhood. I also argue that the three waves of post-war child survivors' testimonies have to be studied together and systematically to understand the full impact of the genocidal past, both short-term and long-term, on young survivors' lives and their multi-generational families, the second and the third generation. And I'm very glad that Bea Levkovich made a similar point in her profound uh, presentation this morning. Listening attentively and critically to child survivors' voices, even to the fragmentary recollections from different stages of child survivors' lives, reveal the messiness and complexities of their lives. These voices oppose the sentimentalizing and redemptive narratives about child survivors imprinted in the goals and structures of many of the post-war archival collections, including also the Shoah Foundation, as Larry Lange mentioned. Sentimentalizing and redemptive narratives are imprinted also in some national cultural context of the memorializations of the Holocaust. Now, the early post-war testimonies. At the heart of my discussions are testimonies of Jewish child survivors from Poland, but many of my arguments and findings would apply to other groups of Jewish child survivors from both Eastern and Western Europe. When the child survivors were interviewed by adult survivors in the early post-war period, they were not aware of the role the members of the Jewish Historical Commissions assigned to them in their interviews. Most of the early post-war interviews were conducted at kibbutzim, Jewish schools, and Jewish children's homes in the early post-war Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and DP camps in Germany, and kibbutzims in Italy, and at Yishuv in the pre-state Israel. Many testimonies had a form of a school assignment. My experiences during the war. What games did we play during the war? The idea of conducting personal testimonies with child survivors was new in the Jewish East European cultural tradition, but had originated in pre-war Jewish social history projects designed at the Ivo Institute in Vilnius, among others, Emanuel Ringelblum, the key historian of the Warsaw Ghetto and creator of the most important collections from within the Holocaust. And just to remind us that today is an anniversary of a Warsaw Ghetto uprising, the first uprising against the Nazis in Nazi-occupied Europe. Interviews based on this pre-war YIVA model continued to be conducted with children and youth in Warsaw Ghetto in 1940 and 1941 in Jewish orphanages and day centers. And we actually hardly make these connections and understand the underpinnings and the whole school of interviewing without actually studying the pre-war ideals and goals. After the war, special attention was paid to the children's emotional relieving of their wartime experiences during these interviews. When the child became overwhelmed by his, her emotions, the interview was usually stopped. In some instances, the child was unable to complete an interview. And we learn about these cases from interviewers' notes, interviewers' interventions written in Polish or Yiddish or other national languages and attached to the children's testimonies. The early post-war child survivors' testimonies constitute a distinct subgroup of archival personal accounts. For example, among the 7,300 personal testimonies collected by the members of the Central Jewish Historical Commission in Poland between 1944 and 1948, 
child survivors born in or after 1929 authored 429 testimonies. Literary scholar Susan Suleiman calls child survivors like herself the one and a half generation. She is a survivor, child survivor from Hungary. This generation could not have an adult understanding of what had happened to them during the war and in the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust. The inability of children to possess and articulate an adult understanding of the world was the main reason why the first collectors, zamblers, and interpreters of these testimonies interpreted these accounts of little values to historians, to the study of the Holocaust. This was the position advocated by Genia Silkes, an active member of the Central Jewish Historical Commission in Poland, herself a survivor, responsible for collecting the children's testimonies and actually responsible also for writing the instructions about how to collect and how to interview child survivors. These instructions were published in Polish and in Yiddish in 1945. So what this position, what Silke's position actually ignored is the fact that children have their voice, agency, and presence. This part of discussion has only begun in the early 2000s among scholars like myself and pioneering scholars of the Holocaust, children, uh, children's in the Holocaust, Nicholas Stargard uh, and Deborah Dvork. Somewhat contradictory, Silkes viewed the children's testimonies as powerful emotional and pedagogical communications of resistance and heroic acts, demonstrating the young survivor's courage practical survival skills, and the vigor of the resistance. One explanation for Silke's position might be that the members of the historical commission had a sense of mapping out an entirely new field of research, destruction research. Therefore, they felt compelled for both historical and moral reasons to concentrate on the big picture of the mechanism of the Nazi extermination of European Jewry and on the political and ideological dimensions of the events, topics that have dominated the historiography of the Holocaust until the 1990s. Some, like Philip Friedman, one of the key historians of the Historical Commission, had a sense that they were collecting material to be analyzed later by historians placed at the greater distance from the catastrophe. However, in spite of Genia Silke's aims of building redemptive and sentimentalized narratives from the child survivors' testimonies, never again here this message actually was born, they reveal difficult traumatic knowledge, painful secret, and communal memories, memories of a generation. That traumatic knowledge is difficult to be repackaged as a soothing, easier memories. When it comes to the pictorial production of child survivors from the early post-war period, this documentation is scattered in different archives in Poland, Israel, United States. Here you actually have a couple of illustrations that come from the YIVO Institute in, today in New York, and Genia Silkes smuggled that whole collections of children's drawings during the Holocaust. Some of them are from within the Holocaust, and in the early post-war period, she smuggled them out of Poland in 1948. And they are hardly actually analyzed or known publicly. And they constitute incredible material to understand the world of being and feeling of child survivors as they emerge from uh, the Holocaust. The early post-war child survivors' testimonies are critical 
to understand the everyday social history of and short-term impact of the Holocaust on the young survivors, their social identities, and their memories. The, uh, the early post-war testimonies contain what is known as secret and communal memories, terms introduced by Christopher Browning in his analysis of the late post-war testimonies of Holocaust survivors, survivors from Starachowice. Till that research, Christopher Browning did not use survivors' testimonies. And then, through this research, he discovered the value of survivors' testimonies and spoke about the core memories, secret memories that become confessional when they become public, as well as communal memories that the survivors from particular villages, places, share among themselves from early 1945 periods in different communities in England, New York, Chicago, uh, Jerusalem. The early post-war te children's testimonies also throw new light on anti-Jewish violence of local populations, complexities and the gray zone of rescue of Jews and add depth to historical studies of specific Jewish communities Studies that we have only very recently, as scholars, started to do. This is a decade and a half of micro histories, important to understand the social dimension. And in those studies, these topics demand knowledge and use of oral histories and archival personal written testimonies of survivors, including children. And I wanted to give you Two examples are difficult examples of uh, using child survivors' testimonies to understand difficult aspects of the history of the Holocaust. He is Hannah Grinberg, born 15 January 1942. She was rescued by somebody who turned to be a rescuer abuser. And this is how she talks about this woman. Uh, in 1946 and also 47, I was so bullied that I almost gave up on leaving. When terrible bombing began, I didn't go to the air raid shelters, but stayed with the cows in the fields. When I interviewed Hannah Greenberg, a resident of uh, a small uh, moshav in Israel in 2006, she told me that in spite of that difficult situation she was in, she recognized that the rescuer uh, saved her life, and that rescuer was given a title of righteous among the gentles. Another example also showing the difficult history, and there is a pattern. We come across many of such voices of child survivors uh, from Poland and uh, I cried, I didn't want to return to the Jews because they were saying that the Jews kill children. I was so afraid, but I found out that things are different here. And he talks about the Jewish children's orphanage. I feel so content, I'm not being beaten up. I learn and go to school. So let me to summarize. Children, actually, in the early post-war period, themselves were able to grasp that some were more physically and emotionally damaged than others, and that some were luckier than others in terms of their wartime experiences. Children who survived the war in hiding with their parents often saw their wartime experiences in hiding as boring, ordinary, and nothing to talk about in comparison to to the children who were on their own and who lost their parents. To conclude, for historians and members of general public who wish to understand Jewish society, Europe, European Jewish society, or the Jewish society in transit, uh, on the level of the family unit, as it emerged from extreme persecution, 
Post-war child survivors' testimonies are indispensable. They are important data in the analysis of how individual self-perception and perceptions of the war and genocide change and remain stable over age and time and maturation. This is why we need to compare them. Early post-war testimonies written nearby and from the bottom unsurpass in terms of showing the immediate imprint of the war on young child survivors. That child survivors' ego documents, similarly to the ego documents of elder survivors, reveal personal perceptions, experiences, reasonings, emotions, and ascriptions of meaning to what befell the young authors in the course of and in the aftermath of the war. And we historians have finally recognized that that subjectivity as is important, perhaps the most important part of the history of the Holocaust and post-1945 Jewish family. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all very much for your presentations. Um, we have 15 minutes till lunch, so please keep your questions incredibly concise. Sir. Uh, so are we being too defensive about Holocaust denial and should we uh, be more, perhaps, more robust in handling it? Not bending, shape. Not bending ourselves out of shape in confronting Holocaust denial. I'm not 100% sure I know what you mean by bending ourselves out of shape, um, but I'm going to answer it as I, I'm going to interpret your question. Um, so I think it's really important that we, and I think it was interesting um, what Joanna was saying about um, child survivors being able to understand the complexity of their own experience. And I think we do need to be able to trust young people to understand the complexity of experiences, because I think if we give them the tools to do so, um, then they can do so. Uh, and the truth of you know, the historical accuracy is really important and, and that needs to be the complexity of the Holocaust as well. So I think if, if in our mission to combat Holocaust denial, which I do think is an existential threat for a variety of reasons, um, we end up simplifying and flattening and decontextualizing, then yes, I would agree with you that we, we can trust young people to deal with complexity and, and we should do so and I think that's more likely to be authentic to them and therefore combat the Holocaust denial at the same time. Uh, Christine, you had one thing you wanted to say. I just wanted to say to you, if you can hear me, hopefully, um, that, you know, just that quote that I started off with um, by Ava Reichman. There she is again. We're going to keep talking about her. Um, but she, you know, she also recognized that sort of existential threat and was also working at a time when Holocaust denial was on the rise. But I think what we can also take away from what she said is that's not the only reason that they did what they did, what we're, that we're doing what we're doing. So I think, I, I also don't quite know what you mean by bending out of shape, but I think it can be one of the motivators, but not the only one. There's so many different reasons that, um, that have been identified here, and I'm sure other panelists will also discuss. Um, but I think it can be a strong, strong motivator, but not, of course, not the only one. Next question, please. Oh. Actually, Sarah, I think you are completely wrong, <laughs> if I may. So, studying, actually working on projects with colleagues globally on the perils to the memorializations of the Holocaust, on the left and the right, 
and we see actually the traveling I, uh, different ideologically ideas, anti-Semitic ideas from left-wing ideologies and right-wing ideologies and, and the spread of them in social medias, also in mainstream works, if you think about textbooks in post-communist Europe or uh, different countries in South America, also I think United States actually to actually the perils to the memorializations of the Holocaust are real and what happens also here that we, are, we have a situation that children's testimonies, Holocaust testim uh, testimonies are being used and abused in, uh, by anti-Semitic authors and repackaged and also uh, Jewish historians are being used out of context as well as the testimonies of survivors. So actually we are now in a, a very difficult period. The 2010, so actually the, under the liberal um, global ideas, uh, the memorialization of the Holocaust as an important aspect of our lives, of communities on national level, to live together in the names of uh, democracy. Whereas here today, we are in a very different reality and there are very real dangers. And you will be surprised what young people learn in different parts of the world about Jewish survivors about, uh, and how the testimonies are being misused. Forgive me for taking too long. Thanks very much. Um, just quickly, I think one of the first people to recognize the dangers of Holocaust denial was um, President Eisenhower when he was with the American troops and they liberated a camp. And he said, take photographs of everything because one day somebody will say it didn't happen. But what I wanted to ask you <laughs> was about um, testimony and its use in novels, which is a problem that I have as a historian, um, that the use of testimony in a novel is confusing because when you read it, you don't know what's true and what's been made up. And this seems to be you know, happening more and more. And a friend of mine whose father was a Holocaust rescuer is suffering from somebody having a written a novel about her father, um, which is completely untrue. My question is, <laughs> sorry, my question is, um, nobody seems to re reference, you know, the difference between basic testimony and what's written in novels. Well, I, I suppose it just it wasn't really the theme of, of, of the panel, um, Agnes, because we were looking at, we were just looking at, in our case, the, the sort of early research um, efforts. Um, and so it, it's very much about people gathering the historical record and, and trying to do what Eisenhower urged people to do, but in the form of, of these eyewitness accounts and interviews rather than, rather than photographs. Sarah. Uh, yeah, so I, I suppose that's the kind of thing that we've been thinking about as well. And, and um, there's a chapter in the handbook on fictionalization. Um, I think there is a difference between um, somebody taking someone else's testimony and fictionalizing it, and witnesses themselves fictionalizing their own testimony, which, they, which, which witnesses do for a variety of reasons. Um, so this was not in the context of the Holocaust, but um, the Romanian novelist that I mentioned, she, she writes fiction about her own experiences, some of which is accurate and to her own experiences, and some of which is fictionalized. And she says she does that in order to create um, a distance between herself and her, and her experiences, but also to be able to say things that are important um, that aren't necessarily kind of historically accurate. Um, but it's also about how things are packaged, and if something is packaged as a testimony and it's not, and we all know there are some very famous examples of that happening, then that is, is, um, is deeply problematic, of course. If something is packaged as a novel, I think we have to read the whole thing as fiction. 
Um, so it's a question, I think, of how things are being read as well. Uh, the lady with red hair, rather than pass, passing the mic to and fro. Just a quick question. Um, so far, nobody has mentioned a Claude Lutzman film, uh, which to my mind is an incredibly powerful account of many, many hours. Uh, is there a reason why this is not being mentioned or used for education? Would anybody like to talk about Shoah and why it's... <laughs> and testimony. You can broaden There's it out. There's actually an expert on the film here sitting in the crowd, Leslie Swift from the Holocaust Museum in Washington. She's just not on the panel, sadly. <laughs> yeah, just to talk about Lonsman, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum does have all the outtakes, uh, many, many uh, hours of outtakes from the film. They are available to use. They are, I, as far as I know, used in education educational projects as well as um, documentaries and things like that. So they're on our website, on our catalog, uh, if, and they're very, very interesting material. And I just, while I have the mic, can I just ask one question? Um, I just wanted to ask uh, Christine and Barbara about uh, Eva Reichman and the collection. Uh, did she have, a, 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 for lack of a better word, a definition of what a Holocaust survivor was? Um, was would she interview kindred transport uh, survivors, or did, what was what did that look like? Christine probably knows more about this, but just to start off and, and say that in terms of, of these accounts, she was looking for kind of um, eyewitnesses, and um, they are. Um, predominantly Jewish, but not necessarily. So she wasn't um, necessarily thinking in terms of survivors, is my impression, but Christine may have yeah, more no, to I, add. Yeah. I would agree with you. And actually, um, she, like Barbara mentioned, she primarily re interviewed or had interviewed Jewish survivors, but she also included Roma and Sinti uh, survivors. And um, the newest book by Ari Yoskovitz talks about this kind of connection that she had with Herman Longbein and you know, Auschwitz survivors broadly defined. Um, so she, uh, it, it's interesting though, um, one of the things I'm looking at in my work is how she kind of, what the relationship between refugees and camp survivors or, or those who survived in hiding within the project is. So it's something that I'm still working on, but it's, it's actually a really interesting question because the relationship um, between her and, and those uh, survivors within the project is, is something that still needs to be explored. And you can get some of it out of the archival uh, correspondence, the kind of differences in, in how they were treated. Um, there was a, uh, a very famous um, survivor here whose name, I've just lost the, the treaty. A cat called, out, uh, called Adolf. She wrote this book about how she you know, encountered um, library staff uh, refugees. Trudy Levy, thank you, thank you. <laughs> it just, just went out. Um, and you know, sort of how she was kind of treated slightly differently as the only person who didn't speak German as her only other language, and she was the only one who survived the camp. So it'll be interesting to kind of situate this within the kind of notion of survivorship in the in the 50s in Britain. It's something I'm doing a bit of work on. I think so, some of the um, accounts, yeah, they're, they're, they're not really survivors, they're not really by survivors, so I can think of an extensive account about what happened in Riga, for example, that's by what you might call a pure right witness as far as anyone could be so. Yeah, sort of bystander. The definition of Holocaust survivors, we have to remember that the definition is not static. That's the key thing, yes, and it has been expanding because uh, by now, we, among the Holocaust survivors, we include of groups of survivors who survive in the depths of the Soviet Union. Or is, uh, many East European Jewish refugees, or Shanghai, also the Jews of Libya. Here we have the North African uh, uh, category that uh, before 2000, before the research of Sergio de la Pelgora and others, uh, has been dismissed. But what is very interesting is that in the, it's the ethnographical works and oral history projects and that with those who survived in the depths of the Soviet Union that made them actually to also identify as Holocaust survivors because the issue of self, is of self-identification. At first, in 1945, or between 1945 and 1956, when those survivors from the depths of Soviet Union came into contact with those who survived in Nazi-occupied Europe, in, 
concentration camps in hiding, they were aware that their experiences, whatever horrible, they were so different from these traumatic experiences of, in, of the children in hiding. So they went silent. Sorry, there we are. Uh, listen, you, you invite the peers, that's what you get. Uh, may I ask you to take your lunch from the buffet in the music room and then return to the long gallery to sit and eat? Sorry? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. 